So this talk is about um, mobiles and how do you make good experiences on mobiles and how you can use JavaScript in that. Um, a little bit about me first. Um, my name is Shwetank. I work as a web evangelist for Opera. Um, we're very, very big on mobiles and other devices, and we, you know, we have a bunch of experience on that. Uh, I'm also part of the W3C, uh, working on two groups. One is called Mobile Web for Social Development, and the other is called uh, Web Education Community Group. You can sit over here if you want. Um, if any of you are on Twitter, this is my Twitter, just my first name, Shwetank, and uh, my email in case you have any questions later on. Um, yes. How many people have seen the show The Wire? The HBO show Wire, right? Four people. Damn it! You should all download it. Oh, not buy it. Um, <laughs> as soon as possible, because according to me, it's the greatest show on earth. And there's also like a Harvard course on the Wire. So, like, anyways, um, I'm going on, off on a tangent. But it's basically about you know a bunch of cops uh, chasing a bunch of drug dealers. And it's a little bit more complicated than that. But the, th but the thing in that show is, especially in the first season, what happens is they, they collect a whole lot of data about each and everything that the criminals talk on the phone, like even the most mundane things. And they somehow connect it together to form this huge, very compelling case against them in court. And I think that's the best metaphor for what we're trying to do over here in the sense that all the pieces matter. That's, that's one of the lines of uh, Lester Freeman, one of the detectives over there, all the pieces matter. So we can't look at one thing in isolation. When it comes to JavaScript, you know, so far the talks have been great, but they've all been pretty much, you know, in isolation, looking at JavaScript, you know, in a particular context. But when it comes to JavaScript in the real world, we have to use it with HD, M, L, right? So we have to use it with that. So. All the pieces matter. It's not just JavaScript. To make a really, really great application, you have to use JavaScript, but you have to use it with a number of technologies. So we, in this presentation, we'll see how to use JavaScript together with all these new technologies that we have in HTML5, right? Especially on mobiles. So we're going to talk mainly about what kind of browsers are we talking about? We're talking about smartphone browsers, right? We're talking about Opera Mobile, or we're talking about you know, the WebKit browsers that you have um, on Android or something, right? But first, spare a thought on you know, what the majority of the web on mobile actually surf on. They don't surf on you know, very full-featured smartphones. You know, they, they surf on very low-end feature phones. And they use stuff like Opera, mobile, uh, Opera Mini, right? is used by about 100 million people, more than 100 million people every month, right, worldwide. So if you're making, you know, a mobile site, then you have to keep in mind those people as well, you know. But this is about the future, so we will focus on that. We will focus on smartphone browsers like Opera Mobile and, uh, you know, all the WebKit browsers. So I want to ask you a question. What's the most important thing to know about the mobile web? Screen size. Bandwidth, okay. Voice? Okay. You know, what the, to me, what the most important thing to know about the mobile web um, is that there is no mobile web. Jing, jing, jing. Um, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by the fact that there is no mobile web? Well, you know, people, I don't know how many people are old enough. You know, I, I look very, very young. But I'm not that young. Um, I, I remember the days of WAP and WML. How many people remember WML? Ah, so you're old as me. So, you know, they try to make a different version of the web. You know, not in HTML, but in a certain other other language called WML. It sucked basically. That's all you need to know. And um, pe people also um, pretty much said the same thing. We suck. They suck. You know, the WML will not actually be anything useful. So they, they went back to the drawing board and said, hmm, there's an idea called HTML. Maybe we should try that. And uh, that's what they did. You know, that, that's what they end up, end up, ended up using. So ultimately, they, they start, wanted to create a different version of the web for mobiles. That didn't work. 
and they used the same thing that they always you know, should have used, which was HTML. So ultimately, we have one web. It's not just, it's not a separate version of the web. It's just one web. It's very, very important to know this. It's, you know, keep, keep this in mind. Um, the second most important thing to know about the mobile web is that it's not about mobiles. That is, it's not about just cell phones. You know, it's about cell phones like these. You have, I don't know how, how many people can see this in the back, but it's basically a cell phone. But it's also about tablets. You know, it can also be about, especially in the coming future, it'll be about TVs. You know, the web is about devices in general. And just like you have the desktop as a device, you'll, you'll have tablets, you'll have TVs, you'll have gaming console, you know, you, you'll have even flight entertainment systems, you know, in the future using a browser. So the web is more than just, you know, PCs and mobiles. It's much more than that. And it's just one web. Keep that in mind. I just had to mention this because I'm from Opera. Um, smartphone browsers not equal to WebKit. You know, people, when, when they think about smartphone browsers, they always think about WebKit. Opera Mobile is pretty big, and it's as good as pretty much anything. So, and furthermore, which WebKit are you talking about? This, have you, how many people have heard of PPK? If you're doing mobile web development, you have to follow this guy's blog. It's called, he's called PPK, basically, Peter Bolkosh, and he's from the Am uh, Netherlands. And um, th he has a very nice article on titled, There is no WebKit on mobile. And what he actually meant was, you know, he compared the native um, Android browser on a number of devices, and he found, he, and he ran a bunch of tests, and he found out that none of them behave exactly 100% the same. You know, each and every, you know, browser was a had a certain branch of WebKit, and none of them were exactly 100% the same. So don't assume that just because you have or that's just because you've tested, you know, uh, your website on one particular WebKit browser, it'll, you know, display and function on all WebKit browsers the same way. It's not necessarily true, right? So keep that in mind as well. And it's okay if the site looks different in different devices. It's okay, right? If you make a separate mobile site, it's okay. However, if you do that, you always have to provide a link to switch back to the desktop version, because we you know, in Opera have you know, um, got this feedback, feedback a, whole, a whole lot. What happens is people make uh, um, uh, m.something.com, and if they think that, okay, this, this guy, this user is from a, a mobile browser, they just automatically redirect that person to m.something.com, and they don't provide a link to switch back. The user wants to visit something.com, the, the, des the desktop version but he is always forced to use m.something.com on, on his mobile, which sucks as a user experience, right? So do not ever do that. If you do, always provide a link to switch back to the desktop version. It's also in a bunch of guidelines. How many people are familiar with this meme? So I just made this, you know? I don't always make a mobile site, but when I do, I, uh, I make sure that users can switch back to the desktop version. That's a better strategy, actually, uh, if, you, if you do something like responsive design, and I'll come back to that, right? But if you, if you want to make a separate mobile site, go ahead. Um, so yeah, this, this thing that I talked about was in this uh, set of best practices. If you haven't looked at it, please look at it. It's called W3C Mobile Web Best Practices Guidelines, RTFG, do that. How am I doing on time? I think I'm okay. Um, so one of the things that you know the guidelines also talked about was offline web apps, and this is where I'm going to explain you know how to how to do it, and then what role does JavaScript play in it. So offline web apps, you know, storing files to need uh, you know to, to run offline. So whenever you're trying to make something a web, app, a web application run offline, there are basically two aspects to it. One is loading the files in an offline environment. The actual HTML, CSS, image files, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the second part is loading the data that you need to run offline, right? So right now we're going to focus on loading the files. How many people are familiar with application cache? Wow, so few. Okay, so just for everyone else, you know, um, application cache is a special kind of cache um, in modern browsers, and you can programmatically set that cache for different web applications, right? 
So it's not like a normal browser cache. It's a special cache. And how do you set that cache? There's a file, just a text file, and that you rename it to something.manifest. Right? In that text file, you say that I, I want these, these, these files to be stored in that cache. Right? So in this case, and the first line has to be cache manifest, by the way. Um, so what you say is, I want style.css, script.js, and index.htm, for example, stored in that cache. Right? Now, how do you link that page to this cache? You do, in the HTML, you do HTML manifest is equal to that thing.manifest. Right? One more important thing to, to note is that manifest file has to be uh, sent with a certain MIME type. Right? So it's cache hyphen manifest. Um, so you have to do that. Do that. Right? Um, I'll go back to this. So what happens is sometimes you know, you want to fall back for some things. For, for example, if the image isn't loaded perfectly, right, it, it hasn't loaded completely, then you, instead of showing just a blank space, have a certain fallback or default image to be shown. You can do that using application cache. So using the fallback section header, you can just say, if original.jpg isn't loaded, in that case, load backup.jpg in its place. Right? So you can do that kind of stuff with application cache. It's pretty nice. Now, generally speaking, w people who are familiar with application cache are familiar with all these things, but but the problem is, you know, how do you update the cache? So once, whenever you have a uh, manifest file and you store it on the server, it has a bunch of files that you say that okay, it needs to be cached, and then you make some other changes, right? And let's call that you know manifest file version two, right? So what happens? You need to make sure that. The, the cache as defined by the version 2 of the manifest file is now used by the browser. How do you do that? Right? That's where JavaScript comes in. And that's where certain functions and events come in. So what you do in this case, what I've done is, you know, I do a set interval and run this every one hour, this function. Right? And what is it? It's called window.applicationcache.update. The, the primary purpose of update is to just check the server and see if there's a new version of, of the manifest file available. And if it is, then download that new version, right? It's still not being used. It's just downloaded it, right? Once it's downloaded, it, there's an event which, uh, which is fired. It's called update ready, which means basically, oh, I've downloaded a new version of the file, uh, of the manifest, right? I have a new application cache. What do I do with it, right? So that's the, that's the basic uh, funda of update ready. Once that happens, then you can finally swap in you know, swap out the old version and swap in the new version, right? And you do application cache dot swap cache, right? You'll be surprised how many people know about you know, application cache, but when I talk about these things, they generally don't, don't, do not. So I would say just note these three functions down. And there's also uh, a tutorial that I've written uh, pretty in-depth on dev.opera.com. You can go there and take a look as well in detail. So update, uh, you know, is basically just firing you know, this, uh, and a request to the server saying if there's a new manifest file, I'll, up, you know, I'll download a new cache based on that. Right? Whenever you hit refresh, it does the same thing as update, actually. So this was about storing the files needed for offline use, right? You store all the files needed for that. But what about the data, right? Any questions so far? Yeah. It will download it, right? But it will not use it explicitly until you call it, right? It will. Whenever you go online once again, it'll say that okay, oh, there's a new version now. Let me download that. But it will not, you know, um, swap in. You know, you will still be using the old version unless you call swap cache, right? So now we come to web storage. So, how many people um, attended Parshuram's talk on Index DB? Quite a lot, right? So you know about you know storing you know of data on a browser level, right? And how you can use IndexedDB, but I'm going to focus more on web storage, right? Uh, the problem is you have cookies; they're unreliable. There's no programmatic APIs really to access that, and it's not structured at all, 
right? And most of all, the file size. What's the max file size of you know a cookie that you can store data in? I think I have a price for that. 32k, no. Yeah. So it's it's 4kb in one or two browsers, but generally it's actually 2kb, right? So it's very very small. So we needed to come up with a solution which is better than that. So we came up with something called web storage, right? Uh, it has two variants. One is called session storage, and one is called local storage. How many people have heard of local storage? Quite a lot. Good. So you're familiar with this then? How to do set item and get item, right? Pretty standard, pretty nice. Um, but what people generally ask me is, you know, we've done this, we've, but how do we sync it back to the server? Or how do we use it in a practical use case? So one of the things you can do, one of the things you shouldn't do actually is this. You can actually store images with local storage. How? Does anyone know? Yeah, so you can just convert it into a data URI and just store that string, you know? But don't, right? Do not ever do that, otherwise I'll spank you. But uh, the reason why you shouldn't is because, you know, it's just a hack. You should probably use um, application cache to store all the files needed, right? So if you're, if you're doing that using local storage, there's something really, really weird or some, some kind of edge case or you're just plain wrong. So one of the things that's pretty cool is, you know, automatically save entered form data. So how many people have encountered this situation? You're writing a really, really long blog post about something, and the browser crashes, right? Or you're writing a really important email, and then the browser crashes. And then you have to start it again. You know, it's like, what the? So you have, it, it, this is a solution to that. So what you can do is something like this. If there is a text area like this, you know, call save message every like half a second or second or whatever, right? In which what you do is, Take whatever has written has been written in that form area till that time and save it to st local storage, right? So even if the browser crashes, right, the next time it opens up, you will still get it. You know, uh, you'll still retain that kind of information which was there till the last time it was saved, right? Hmm. Yeah, so for that, you have to use session storage then, right? So that, that's probably a different use case. That's not uh, probably the best way. I mean, Discuss uses this, by the way. How many people are familiar with Discuss? Discuss is a commenting system on various blogs, so it uses this. You know, it, it, it doesn't do it every second or something. It, uses, it does it every few keystrokes or something. It, you know, it saves it to local storage. So you can probably do this. Um, there are certain gotchas, you know, certain things to keep in mind when it comes to, to local storage. You know, two tabs updating the same value. You know, if you have a tab you know, which is storing local storage data, and then you have a clone of that tab or some other tab which is trying to, once again, store the same kind of data, right? then there's a mismatch. You know? to, to give you an example, let me open up. If you can actually wrap your mind around the crazy number of tabs that I have, uh, just look over there on the bottom. It says, change from this to this. Right? How did I do this? By using something called Storage events, right? How many people are aware of storage events? One. Wow. So, yes, you can use something called storage events. We'll talk about that. It's very, very simple. So, whenever something like this has been done, you know, whenever something, um, whenever local storage, you're using local storage and some other page has updated the same value, then storage event is fired. And when that happens, you can simply do event.old storage to get the old value and event.new storage to get the new value. So, so I use basically this to say this has changed from 
the old value to the new value, right? So storage events is something that pretty much no one knows about but should, right? And uh, please, please note that down. Yes, I actually did this demo on session storage. So you can do that. Um, I, once again, I've written an article on dev.opera.com explaining all of this. Um, so go check it out. One more thing is, if you're using local storage or session storage, don't do it on a free hosting service in which they provide a different directory for like each and every user. For example, if you have like freehosting.com slash user1 for your account and freehosting.com slash user2 for the other account, you know, they're using the same domain, right? So they can theoretically access your data. So try not to use local storage or session storage on free hosting accounts which provide like a different UR, uh, different directory, right? If it's a sub, if it's a sub, a sub directory, or sorry, subdomain, then it's fine, right? Yeah, shared hosting. So, yeah, so if it's like abc.something.com and bqr.something.com, those are both different origins, right? Those are treated as different origins. So that's fine. But, you know, freehosting.com slash user1 and freehosting.com slash user2, that's treated as the same origin, right? So they can access your data. Don't do that. There are other storage options, you know, as been mentioned. You have IndexedDB, you have WebSQL. You know, people have been bashing WebSQL a whole lot, but I think if you're just concerned with making, you know, uh, a site which is specifically target, targeted just for mobiles, then I think it's okay to use WebSQL. The reason is because browser support is there uh, when it comes to most, or pretty much any WebKit-based browser as well as Opera Mobile. And that covers a whole lot of mobile browsers, smartphones, right? So if you're just concerned with only and only smartphone browsers, then WebSQL is an okay option to consider, right? One more thing, this has nothing to do with JavaScript, by the way. I'm just, yeah. Cookies do still have their place. You can't, you know, this is not a complete 100% replacement for cookies. You know, it is just for storing small amounts of data here and there. Right? But cookies have more uses than just that, right? So it's not a 100% complete replacement for cookies. Is there a local storage in what? You can programmatically do it, but there's no. I think it's clear. I think if I'm if I'm right, there's local storage dot clear, but I'm not sure about that. I'll have to check. Yeah. Uh, you can also manually, if you if you want, you can clear local storage using your own browser. The user can do it manually. By default, the local storage space is 5 MB. So, and if if you go beyond 5 MB, then the browser is supposed to ask the user, do you want to allow more storage space? So now we come to media queries. How many people have heard of that? Responsive design, yes? Good. So media queries is all about this. So if, when it comes to mobiles, you have different devices with different resolutions, and how do you make sure that you have just one CSS file or just one you know, set of rules and have it adjust to different resolutions? So what you can do is use something called media queries. Like over here, what you, what you do is you say, you know, at PDA all and min width 480px, max width 800px, so all of these styles are going to be applied to only those devices whose min width is between 480px and 800px, right? And all those devices whose max width is less than 480px, you know, the, the second set of rules will be applied, right? So you can search on, you know, media queries and how you can use them pretty, pretty nicely. There's a site called media queries with, the, with a dot before the ES. So it's mediaquery.es, right? So that's a very, very good showcase site of how many sites in the wild are using media queries. If you go to my.opera.com, it's also using media queries. Uh, I think the Boston Globe also redesigned their site, which is a very, very nice site, uh, which is using media queries. So go ahead and look on that. Uh, I'm not going to focus too much on this because it's not related to JavaScript. I just wanted to mention it. Um, what, how many people have uh, known of a viewport? So about 10% people. Uh, so viewport is something also very, very interesting. So if you're, if you're familiar with media queries, then you should also probably know about viewport. There's a meta tag called the viewport meta tag. 
So generally what happens is if you go to a page using your mobile browser, it provides like a zoomed out view of the page like this. And then you tap in or do something and you know it focuses on that particular part of the page, right? Right? So that's what happens. But if you're making a web application, right, and you don't want that behavior, you want the user to automatically just have a zoomed in version of that particular page. You don't want, to want him to tap and then have a zoomed in. So what you can do is set the amount of scaling you know, by default. And that's what the viewport is useful for. So you can do something like this. You know, you can have like meta name is equal to viewport, content is equal to width is equal to 320. So it will have like a 320px um, viewport. And if the device size is more than 320, uh, 320, then it will zoom out to fit 320, right? The best thing to do actually is do something like viewport, content, width is equal to device width. Right? So it will automatically judge the device width and set the width of the viewport to that exact level. Right? This is very, very useful. But you can also do something more. You can you know, have scaling constraints, constraints. So you can do maximum scale to minimum scale 0 0.5. So you can you know, make sure that the person can only sc scroll like maximum of 2x and scroll out a maximum of 0 0.5x. You know? So that's very, very good. Also, what you can do is you can disable user scrolling. So in games, this might be useful, right? So you can do, you know, user scalable is equal to no, right? Once again, this has nothing to do with, you know, JavaScript. I'm just mentioning it. In Opera, we've also implemented it using CSS because according to me and Opera in general, you know, uh, this actually belongs more in CSS rather than having a meta tag, right? It's more of a presentation feature. So you can do that using, in Opera, using the at viewport feature as well. Exact same thing. The geolocation. How many people know about geolocation? How many people know how it works? Okay. So th this was. I'm not going to spend too much time on geolocation, by the way. Um, so the early web was, you know, how this is my, you know, page in HTML. Look at it. You know, this is my. Uh, these are my thoughts in a well-published format. And then you had like this. But this was, you know, about here we can do stuff together. And you know, Wikipedia is the best example of that. You know, and then the next step was, hey, this is what I'm thinking, you know, and this was Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. I think the next step is, hey, this is where I'm at, you know, and uh, provide me goods and services in relation to where I'm at. And uh, this is where I think geolocation is pretty nice. So you can have like augmented reality, geocaching, location aware, advertising, and all that kind of stuff. Um, one thing. You know, to know is if you're doing geolocation, then first of all, you know, feature detect, right? Don't do browser sniffing. I see so many people who are doing browser sniffing for geolocation. They say that, okay, these, these browsers support geolocation, so I'll only have code for that. You know, don't do that. Instead, do something like this, navigator.geolocation. If it's available, then have, you know, look, geolocation.get current position. One more thing is, though, that uh, I've seen some people do call get current position and have a set interval for that. You know, instead of that, you can probably use watch position. Right. So watch position. How many people know about watch position? No. Okay. So it's exactly like get current position. The only difference is it keeps calling it every time it detects a change in location. Right. So every time you move, watch position will be called. Right. Um, so that's the only difference. Uh, get current position is just a one shot thing. It's just called once. But this will be called every time you move or every time it detects a move. So, and one more thing is, you know, dealing with errors. You know, so if position error is equal to one, you know, that means that the user explicitly has said, no, I don't want to share my location. Right? Whereas if it's two, for example, then it's for some reason hasn't been able to load it. And accuracy, you know, geolocation is scarily accurate in some places and retardedly, you know, really amusingly accurate in some certain other places, right? For example, in, in Bangalore, it's actually pretty accurate, generally speaking. Um, but in from where I come from, Chandigarh, you know, it's like laughable. It's like, what the, I'm not here, I've never been there, you know, it's like, it's like that. So don't rely on that. Don't rely on geolocation as, you know, in, in production. Always have a fallback. Always have a way to for the user to enter 
their location data, right? Either as a PIN code or something else. You know, always provide them a way to choose, you know, what their location is. Don't always 100% rely on geolocation because it's not always accurate. When it is, sometimes it's very, very accurate. You know, it depends on how well mapped the city is. One more thing, uh, the geolocation spec, you know, it's, it's been quite a while since this has been published, but uh, the new version, people are coming together once again to, to discuss a new version of the geolocation spec. So there may be some changes here and there, just as a heads up, I'm saying. Um, so yeah, time for a sneak peek. Um, so I'll be talking about, uh, where is it? There's not a gun, don't mind. Uh, is this is called device orientation. Let me open up a labs build of Opera Mobile. Right. Okay. So hopefully you can see this. Even if it's in, you know, the text is murdered, it doesn't matter. You know? So just play along. So you see this. The first thing to know is, I don't know, uh, let me repopulate the form. Like this? Uh, so one thing is, if I'm changing the position of this, the background color keeps changing. How did I do this? If I'm just I'm just moving this around. So there's a new spec called the device orientation spec, right? Which gives you access to stuff like the gyroscope and the accelerometer and stuff like that. And we even we in Opera have implemented this as in a labs build, but it's going to come soon, you know, um, in production as well. So this is just a labs build, by the way. One more thing that you might notice is there's some text written. Don't try to read it, but it's just some text, right? But if I shake it, it's gone. So this is using the accelerometer. So I said that, okay, I detect the acceleration, and if it's a, after a certain threshold, then I clear the form, right? So you can, you, you can, <laughs> yeah, it will. So you have to use this with care, right? So. Uh, But the thing is, you shouldn't use this while driving anyways. So, yeah. so this is how you use it. You know, there's, you just have an event listener for device orientation. For the browsers which support device orientation, you know, you'll, you'll be able to get, you know, using the event alpha, event beta, event gamma, you can get the alpha, beta, gamma position coordinates of the device, right? And then you can do whatever the hell you want to do with it. In this case, I set the RGB values going to the, R, you know, the alpha, beta, and gamma values, right? So every time I moved it, this event was fired, and it set the RGB value of the background color to that. That's why the background color was changing every time I was moving it, right? One more thing is access to the accelerometer, right? So you can do that using the device motion event, right? And then you can get the acceleration and X, Y, and Z coordinates, you know, and a bunch of other stuff as well. So just just keep this in mind, you know, the W3C device orientation spec. Just search it, you know, it's interesting to know. Another sneak peek that I wanted to show you. I hope this works, by the way. It's a very, it's a labs build, so it crashes all the time. But um, so this is basically inside a web page, you know, inside a browser, you now have access to the camera, right? So this is pretty cool. This is this is something that I really really like, and uh, you can actually even take pictures. You know, say hi. 
right? And what I did was I you know used canvas to create like Polaroid pictures. <coughs> right? And once again if I shake it, it's gone. <laughs> So I used you know device motion for that. So you can do some pretty cool stuff, you know, once you integrate, you know, as I did, you know, uh, HTML video. It uses this video tag. It uses camera axis. It uses device orientation. It uses web fonts, and a bunch of other stuff. I didn't have enough time. Otherwise, I would have talked about mouse gestures as well. You know, uh, multi-touch and all that kind of stuff. You can do that, by the way. Yeah, so these, I mean, yeah, there's a whole different presentation in itself if I, if I try to talk about that. Hmm. Uh, it depends on browser to browser. Um, we in Opera support WebM, we support OGG, right? We don't support H.264, right? Um, there are certain other browsers which support H.264, but they don't support WebM, like, you know, Safari or something, right? Um, Chrome, I think, supports all or something. But in general, I think WebM will win. Ultimately, everyone will have to support the WebM. I don't see any other any other way. But anyways, let's see the code behind it. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Um, not right now, but soon. Soon. This is a labs version. It's not even a beta. It's not even an alpha. It's like a labs experimental version that we have. Right? So it's not going to come in any mobile browser soon, but it is there. We have worked on it and everything. One of the main reasons why it's still in a labs build and not in a beta or something is because the spec is very, very new, and it's being changed quite a lot. You know, Even when we implemented this, the spec changed, and then we had to re-implement this. Right? Yeah, it's what wig, basically. Right, so there is a spec. There is a W3 spec called the Web RTC Real Time Communication. So it, it uh, specifies, you know, camera access, mic access, um, and a few other things that I'm forgetting right now. So and peer to peer communication and that kind of stuff. So right now we've implemented just camera. Um, so yeah, uh, how do you do this? Um, you do something called navigator.getUserMedia. If it is supported, then it probably has camera access, right? So the first thing to check is navigator.getUserMedia. If there is, then you check for you no know, video. If it is there, then a success function is called. Otherwise, an error function is called. Right? So let's see the success function. You, by the way, select the video element. Then what you do is, in the success function, there's a stream element, a media stream element, which is basically just access to the camera stream. So what you do in the success function is just associate that camera stream with the HTML5 video element that you have. That's it, right? And then what you do is, once you have the camera stream as part of the video, then you can use draw image to put it on canvas. And once you have the camera access on canvas, then you can go crazy, batshit insane. You can you know, do all kinds of stuff. So this is how you put it on canvas, you know? You just do CTX to draw image video element, no zero, zero till canvas width and canvas height. This time? And it's my presentation's time as well. So keep in mind, WebRTC spec, you know, the, the stuff which defines all this, is very much in flux. It's still not ready yet, but we are working on it. Browser makers are continu continually making progress. Read up on dev.opera.com. These are all, you know, all my articles and a bunch of other very, very nice articles are there. Um, and if you have more questions, you know, you can contact me on Twitter or on email on shwetangdi at opera.com. And with that, I'll say thank you.